Welcome back to Inglorious Finance. I'm your host, Mike Mako. This is Patrick Stoa. I'm Andrew Freilich. And on this episode of Inglorious Finance, we're going to talk rings, weddings, and how to handle money when you start entering marriage. Stay tuned. On this episode of Inglorious Finance, we're going to talk weddings and rings and uh, how to handle money when you're just starting off in marriage. So we're just going to jump right into wing. Wings. Wings. We're going to have wings. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put a wing on my finger. <laughs> it begins. Yeah. Oh, the poor kid. Lucky he's not on live radio, but we could keep this. You know, <laughs> when I was wings? growing up, I had a speech impediment regarding R's and W's. Oh, really? really. <laughs> oh, so I'm if really we're talking yeah. about my early childhood again, oh, thanks, guys. Crying out thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. My really wabbits. Cool. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Andrew Freilich. Good to be here. <laughs> Good to be yeah. live. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Not your first time on the show. No. Okay. Although, yeah. Seems so, like it there. So, wedding rings. Yeah, and, and I think before we jump into that, and that's going to be our first topic, I just want to preface this as to who this should be for, and I think it's really anybody who's... Married people? Yeah, it can be, and we're going to talk about some stuff that maybe, you know, will be relevant for them, but I think this is for people who are, you know, even if you're single, you know, just we're, we're going to try to impart some wisdom and some... Some things that we think uh, would be a good way to get started. Um, no. But also, you know. I wonder if I'm going to have to, like, actually cut that out or pay to have that licensed now that I said that. Probably, yeah. <gasps> They're gonna Hopefully, find Beyonce you. doesn't listen to our podcast. And I think also, you know, if you're, if you're a parent of <laughs> um, and your child is, is in their 20s or getting close to this, um, I think. You know, having realistic expectations and and talking with them about this is probably something that would be very valuable for them. So it comes fast. Okay, so here's you. I don't know if you remember this, but so for our listeners, Andrew has been here for what two and a half years? Sure. And um, you started when you were a student at GB, and you didn't even know Amanda, right? And I remember telling you, like, hey, you know, I I met Beth, and then. We were friends, and then we dated, and and s- a few months later we got engaged, and we went from being from dating to married in in a year. And I remember talking to you about that, and I feel like you were. It's hard to imagine, right? Like, yeah. Did you think that you'd be at this point, like a year ago? No, a right? year ago, absolutely not. Right. No. How old are you now? Twenty two. Just in January, though. Yes. Right, and we're recording this in early April, so. Um, it does come fast, and we were having that conversation when you were what, seventeen, eighteen? No, yeah, no, no, more no, like no. nineteen. But 19, yeah, sorry. yeah. I'm good at math. <laughs> <laughs> Under twenty, which was pretty funny, right? And I think it's funny. A lot of the people that I talked to, for example, my parents and some other people, I was like, "Well, how long did you guys date?" And they're all like, "Oh, yeah, you know, six months. We were married within a year." And I was like, "Are you serious?" You know, I think um, in today's culture, it's not unusual for people to date two three four or five years you know and then Holy get married cow. and it's like get yeah. milk for free yeah 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 mm-hmm. so so it's funny but i think you know <laughs> this isn't glorious i fine. guess it is on inglorious the, on oh, the flip side of that i mean come on so uh i just to put it in there i dated stuff for gosh it must have been six or seven years before we got married Man. it was a long time i was chicken Really is what it came down to. I was chicken. And that comes from past history. My parents have been divorced, and I, I didn't want to go through that again. So I was hesitant to that's ask fair. her to marry. Yeah, that's, 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 fair. that's what it was. Mm-hmm. But I, I'll tell you, I knew I knew right away. Um, and, and it took another person, a, a mentor, to basically say, what the heck are you waiting for? Get on with it. You're, you're wasting your, your time. So anyway, yeah, it, it, it does come on fast. I was too chicken to act on the speed with which uh, during that time that I already knew. So you mustered up the courage. Yeah. And you went and got a ring. Yeah. So that leads into our first Oh, my topic, gosh. What right? a segue. Well done. Yeah, good Sister job. Sister Radio Man. <laughs> uh, uh-huh. Yeah. So are you looking at rings? I have bought a ring already. Oh. Um, when did you get this ring? I uh, I got the ring at the end of March, so we're we're recording this in April here, and you still got it, huh? And I still have it, which um, is interesting because this podcast airs in not that long from now. It's the tenth of April, and when and does it by go? the time this airs, I probably won't have it in my possession any longer. So consider that a dare. A dare, yeah. yeah we I might have to have an yeah. addendum to this uh, 
You said Amanda evil. doesn't listen to this podcast, but I bet she's going to listen to this one. Yeah, I got a feeling about that one, huh? <laughs> so I think, you know, the first thing, and this is the big thing with people, is the cost. Like, how much are you going to spend on a ring? What's reasonable? Don't talk about people. Talk about you. What was your thought process? Well, mine was, you know, I kind of had a budget. Um, and I think, you know, that kind of came from what other people I knew my age had spent. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who are like, oh, you should spend this amount. And I'm like, oh, man, that's a lot. I don't think I could do that. And, uh, you know, funny enough, Mike and I actually went and looked at rings and I remember looking at him and he's like, oh yeah, this one's like $7,000. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to be spending that much. I know that's for sure. I didn't say, well, I mean, I pointed it out, but that was not like, don't, I don't want our listeners to think I was recommending you drop seven grand. No, no. So, <laughs> so we looked, I looked this up and, and the average is around 1000 to 5000 That's what a lot of people spend. For an engagement ring. For an engagement ring. Mm-hmm. So just that in ring. And I think, you know. Anywhere in that spectrum is reasonable, and if you go above that and you have the means to do so, um, you know, that's okay, too. I think a lot of people, when they're younger, you know, you don't have that money laying around. Yeah, so it's, it's not sitting around. I, I think you, Patrick I, and I both did not pay cash. No, I loaded up two credit cards because that's the only <laughs> way I could do it. I think like, I probably did the same. Yeah, I don't remember. That was it. No, I yeah. paid it. I had the cash available, but I paid it on a credit card, not, and that's a different story. Points, baby! But, Another you know, I think that's the other thing, you know, and... We're big proponents of this, but points. Well, <laughs> yes, <laughs> but also, you know, if you don't have the money, y- you really shouldn't be, you know, spending that on a card and yeah. carrying that balance. So, despite you, what we both did, <laughs> <laughs> you took me along to be your wingman. I did, <clears throat> and um, then did proceeded to disregard my advice to buy a smaller ring. You're welcome, Amanda. I guess I don't know. <laughs> um, and you're poorer, Amanda. Yeah. Huh? And you're poor. You're welcome and you're poor. <laughs> well, he was responsible, though, I will say, right? I mean, we both, I think, I I don't remember. It was like 14, 15 years ago when I did that. But I think I probably had a couple credit cards, too. But um, and then, but didn't have the cash. <laughs> um, but you, you did, and yeah, you and planned I, for that I expense. knew it was coming, and I had been saving for five months, and I knew I wanted what I wanted to do, and, and I was ready for it. So I think, you know, that's... To Mike's point, that's one of our tips is bring somebody with you that can hold you accountable and keep you there. Although I did not take the person who I brought with their advice. I'll just point that out. But it it was good to have them there (laughs) because who knows? I could have gone even crazier with it. Um, And, you know, I think the other thing to keep in mind is the other, you know, cost associated with getting a ring, which is, you know, assuming she says yes. um, If you're a guy, uh is to take into mind wedding bands and the cost associated with that. Um, and maybe that leads more into our wedding planning, but it's just something to keep in mind. That's typical, by the way, <coughs> right? So typically, you know, for if we have really young listeners, right, who um, have no real idea or family members or friends who've gone through this process, but uh, typically you propose with an engagement ring, which is typically the one that has the big stone on it, the solitaire, usually, mm-hmm. right? And then usually there's also a wedding band, which is the second part of that that is given um, at the ceremony, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And that's not usually, that doesn't usually have a big stone on it. It's usually pretty inexpensive, a few hundred bucks probably for most people. Yeah. I'm sure you could buy a real expensive one, but that's typical. And then for men, um, we typically have a band, not with a solitaire, a lot of times, uh, is yours have a solitaire? Yeah, Mike's looking at mine. Mine does have a, a diamond in it, and mine's got uh, both a white and a yellow gold yeah. on uh-huh. it. Uh, mine it has was, diamonds it was, in it, but they're small, yeah. you know, things. So and this was, was fancier than that few hundred. I want to say it was a, a little over a 1,000. Now, this was back in 1995, <laughs> so uh, so quite a time ago. Now, looking back on it, uh, you know, I would have been just as happy now if this was simpler. I just wasn't just as happy then. I wanted something fancier then. Um, and I think that kind of points to expectations on both ends. Um, you know, that's it, it depends on your relationship, but, you know, talking with one another about kind of those expectations, not only for spending, but, you know, maybe for some desi- design aspects. I don't know about you guys. I know I did. Holy cow. I know I did. She might as well have been there with you. You know what? I said, what do you like? Is that a millennial Just, thing? Hey, I don't want you to be upset with this, you know. 
multi thousand dollar hopefully, piece of hey, jewelry. Hopefully, I you're only doing it once, and it, hey, it's a couple thousand dollars. Why not get it right? No way, man. I know people who've lost like two or three rings. Really? That's oh true. yeah. Oh, oh yeah. My mom lost a ring. I think mm. um, years ago, my parents were on a boat and it just slipped off. It's in Green Bay somewhere. <laughs> wow. Probably a lot of rings in the bay. Probably yeah. Yeah, under silt. Um, yeah. And I know, also know people, by the way, this is a valid yeah. thing. I know people who have gotten smaller stones. Uh, we have some friends who go to church with us, uh, Andrew and I, and um, they have been married for, I want to say, 25 years. And I think maybe uh, one of their anniversaries, 20th or something mm-hmm. like that, um, he got her a bigger stone because oh. he was in, I think, better financial seminary or something yeah. when, he, when they got married and couldn't really afford a much. And... Uh, so that's a thing. People do that. You know, if they say, well, here, let's get married. And then later in life that, yeah. I don't know, that's, that's, that happens. You know, one of the things that uh, sharing back to you in my experience, there was a, a, I didn't end up purchasing my ring this way, but I did go looking with a person that had a lot of experience with jewelry at pawn shops. Hmm. And now you got to oh, imagine yeah. there's a whole lot of rings that get taken off when people get divorced. Yeah, and for sure. s- some of those end up in pawn shops. Now the trick to that is, you really have to know what you're looking at. Yeah. And if you don't really know what you're looking at, you could really get taken for a ride. Right. Yeah. Because um, like, I wouldn't know a cubic zirconia from a yeah. VVS one. I probably would. That's the <laughs> only thing, by the way. The only bit of knowledge I know about cut, color, clarity, and carat weight. That's mm-hmm. right. Yeah. Those are the, the, the things, by the way. I did my research for what it's worth back in the day on BlueNile.com. To kind of brush up on those things. I did my research before there was internet, so there. <laughs> there was internet. It's <laughs> well, the, there the, barely. The military had it. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> it was America Online, yeah. and it cost a fortune to pull up the picture of a of anything on the exactly. internet. Exactly. With your one hundred minutes of internet per month. <laughs> <laughs> um. So I think it just. I mean, just be realistic too, and just talk. You know, and I know that's not easy for everybody to do, and. To be honest, I know a friend who brought his girlfriend with, and they went and looked at rings together. And that's one thing you can do. And if, if that's kind of how you feel your relationship is and you're comfortable doing that, you know, it's hard to get it wrong if she picks it out. I'll just say that, right? You know? I, I, yeah, I guess. <laughs> but uh, So I want to go back to the to the pawn shop thing, yeah. the secondary market. So there was a time at which Beth and I um, – you know, we're still pretty young in our careers and dealing with like student loans or something. I don't remember what. And we thought, hey, you know, your ring was worth a lot. And we were at the point where we we're like, why did we spend all that money on a diamond? By the way, for our listeners, I know more people who don't give a hoot about the size of the stone on their rings. Um, so I know some people do, whatever. I'm not saying that it's wrong. But if you are under the impression that, you are going to really value that, I would question that premise because I know a ton of people who don't value it at all. So don't stretch if you think that that's somehow either socially or or important Mm -hmm. or if you think it's going to be important for you five or ten years from now because we realized that we didn't care. In fact, I just got my wife's... um, she She took her solitaire off when my son was born. He's three and a half now. She didn't wear it for two years, partly because... Uh, she scratched him or she felt like she would scratch him when he was a baby. But then there was like a prong that was loose. Mm. And she just wore a wedding band for two years. And I was like, oh, I should probably get that fixed. <laughs> and I finally did that. And that's how important it was. Like, not at all. So, um, mm-hmm. but we had explored this, right? So you and I both bought our rings from the same guy, Adam Funk, great friend of mine. I've known him for 20 years. He's a certified gemological appraiser, one of only a few in the state of Wisconsin. Fabulous guy, has... Works, and here's a shout-out to Diamonds of Gold in Green Bay. So you want to talk to a super guy who really knows what he's talking about. Um, I did. I worked with him years ago when he worked at a jewelry store in the mall, and now you worked with him now. So mm-hmm. um, definitely knows. But I went to Adam, and I was like, hey, can we hawk our diamonds and pay off some student loans or something? And he was like, yeah, there's, like, no secondary market for those. Like, uh, in fact, he was I, I was talking about losing one of these little diamonds in my ring here. And these are tiny. I think my, I've got like eight of them in here, but this whole ring was maybe 600 bucks. So that's how small they are. Mm-hmm. And he said, like, if you lost one of those diamonds, I would probably just pop one in and not charge you. Wow. That's how invaluable they are from a secondary market perspective. Mm. Like, And this comes down to, you know, 
De Beers, mm-hmm. basically, is the company in the world that has a corner on this market, a monopoly, which is artificially keeping prices of stones higher. But on the secondary market, my point is, is to it, or to substantiate yeah. what you just said about going to a pawn shop, um, if you just want and you know, or if you have someone, or I don't, I'm not saying Adam would want to. <laughs> he's probably not going to want to come with you um, to check out, you know, a stone at a pawn shop to see if it's legit. But uh, y- there's tremendous value in our... Anyway. Yep. Yeah. All right. What's next, dude? Why don't we take a break, and when, we're com- when we come back, uh, we're just going to touch on weddings and some of the costs associated with that and, and some of the tips that we had and... Obviously, I'm not in it yet, but you guys have both gone through it, so we're going to touch on a couple of the things when we come back. Welcome back to Inglorious Finance. This is Andrew Fralick. Switching gears to wedding planning. If you have already bought the ring, now is the time to tune in if you haven't done the wedding yet. Um, and we're just going to jump right into some of the things that we feel are most important um, financially, but also, um, you know, just for your sake uh, when planning a wedding. And Mike, what do you think? You went through a wedding. What was the biggest thing in planning for a wedding that you think was most important? I don't even remember. I still have a spreadsheet, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. I still do. Um, we got married um, in 2004, August of 2004 in the Chicago area, western suburbs. And um, that is not an inexpensive place to get married. So um, in an effort to do it, it, here's the thing. I, I want, If I would want our listeners to keep something in mind as they're preparing for a wedding, um, when you choose a partner, you should be planning for a marriage. Um, it's a lifetime, right? So... The wedding is a party, but that's not what it's all about, right? And I think that's important to have some perspective on the wedding event, right? And the reception, which is the wedding is cheap. It's like, you know, maybe the church charges you a few hundred bucks. Maybe you give the pastor who's officiating a few hundred bucks. Um, But that's about it for the ceremony, usually, in a church. But after that, it's the reception. And it's all those other costs. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. Right. So we chose to have a luncheon and not a dinner that was cheaper in the Chicago market. Uh, (laughs) The iPod was pretty new back then. (laughs) And I got one uh, with some money I got for college graduation and I used it to buy an iPod. iPod. And that's how we did music. We didn't have a band. Um, So I don't know. Those are some of the things we did to try to keep costs down. And it was still over 10 grand, I think. You know, it's interesting. Now, we, I got married in 1995, and Steph did a lot of the planning. Now, the, the marriage, the wedding was in Marshfield, which is her hometown. And uh, in the reception, our reception happened to be at a dance hall that was owned by members of her family. Um, so that was inexpensive as well. That also was the only option presented to me. <laughs> um, so it, it, it was interesting because one of the things you mentioned, at the end of the day, you're still married. And, and like the reception wasn't the reception that I had envisioned as I had sort of this, uh, uh, you know, large idea. And then I had an idea that Steph hated about, oh, at our reception, we should have it at a park and we should have horseshoes and people can go swimming and all these other things. I'm sorry, and, horseshoes? Yeah, seriously. Awesome. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> but none none of those things actually happened. They were all she put the kibosh on uh, on pretty much all of that. Um, but at the end of the day, we were still married and we had a great time. Our wedding was known as the hot wedding because we had no air conditioning either in the church or the reception hall. What what month? Uh, Maybe June so. June seventeenth. Oh yeah, uh-huh. and it was in Central it, Wisconsin. It's yeah, in Central. Party. It was probably ninety eight degrees. I went out of the reception oh, hall. Goodness. Uh, at, at about seven o'clock, in between some dancing, just to get a little fresh air, and half the cars were running in the parking lot. People had gone outside to turn on their cars to get air conditioning. They, they were, were sitting in there. They were in sitting their in their cars. <laughs> yes, half the people were sitting in their cars at that time. With their, uh, With their bloody Marys or their, uh, I guess, old yeah, fashions. old fashioned. Old there, that's yeah. what it is. They're probably Central yeah. That's, so that's back now, by the way. <laughs> one of the things that was interesting because it was a, a family. A member that owned the reception hall we had um, uh, the the meal and the drinks and everything were fairly inexpensive there also was only one menu offered it was the meal that they always serve 
um, because that's just the way it was. So, mm-hmm. so we, I didn't end up with a lot of choices, but there were a lot of things that were really memorable about it. So I guess my takeaway to listeners from that is to um, view the event, the event itself as a party, but not get hung up on a lot of things that aren't going to go perfectly. They're not. Matter of fact, I'll, I'll just share with you at, at one in-laws wedding that I was at, the power went out at the reception. Oh, man. And they were kind of afraid they weren't going to be able to serve dinner. And they were getting pretty close to ordering pizza huh. because the, the, the place, the, you know, the kitchen staff wasn't able to cook any food. The whole power was out. So things can go uh, a little crazy, but at the end of the day, you're still married. And like you pointed out, Mike, it's a lifetime. Yeah. And, and that day is, is simply a party. You know, I got to tell you, man, uh, too, I think I, I regret a couple things on uh, decisions that we made. On our wedding, you know, like you would, I, I want to encourage you, right? And we've talked about this, right, Andrew? Pointing to Andrew, forcefully, <laughs> um, that that it's about you two. You two chose each other, which is unique. I had coffee with a guy this morning from from my church, and I was just saying, you know, the marital relationship is unique in that you are two grown adults who choose to be with each other. Um, we don't choose our parents. Our parents don't choose us. I mean, they love us and we love them, but it's different. You know what I mean? And so it's all about you and everybody else is going to, I mean, and we've even talked about friends mm-hmm. in, that you had in high school and college and your lament a little bit over kind of how you're losing touch with some of those folks and you're going to probably reach out to some of those people, but some of them are not really going to be part of your life probably five years from now. And that's just life, right? Patrick and I have seen that play out. Yeah, oh yeah. And, um, and so remember that, um, I was the best man of, in the, in a a guy's wedding when we were in college and I haven't spoke to him since I think probably. So my point is this, right? Um, if you think about it, try to insert as much of your wishes into wedding stuff, right? That's important. Now there's the whole politics of oh, who yeah. to invite oh, yeah, yeah and setting boundaries and you invite this person then you gotta invite that person and then you gotta think about where to seat people because you know i don't know but here's what i would tell you some of the f- like most chill and fun weddings i've been to have been really unscripted and low-key um we went to one of beth's good friends from high school got married that was a potluck a potluck we all brought food Hmm. That was so fun. Wow. Um, it was really unique, It and I still remember it. I don't remember a lot of the weddings I went to because they're all the same, but I remember that one. That was cool. Uh, and that was in Chicago, and that was a cool way to keep things in check, costs in check. Mm-hmm. I've been to, recently, a couple years ago, some friends of ours in the Appleton area got married and had a uh, buffet. Yeah. And uh, so that was really cool. Not as uncommon, but yeah. And we've planned events, client events mm-hmm. and things here. And it all comes down to how many people are coming and what's the cost per plate. Yeah. Isn't food like the most expensive thing? 200 people at yeah, know, I mean, 50 bucks a plate? Yikes, 10 grand. Did I do the math right? Yeah. And that's that's a little high. And, it, and of course, it depends sure. on where you live. But I think that's the key takeaway is, you know, if you have on one side of the spectrum over here, you know, running away and getting married and the other spectrum is satisfying, you know, if your parents have a lot of desires and inviting 200, 250 people, where do you kind of fit in between there? And where's your, you know, your happy place in terms of satisfying all your requirements in the wedding and also, you know, making sure it is a party and, you know, making sure people have fun and it's not just, you know. Now, the truth yeah, of the we, matter uh, is if they're paying for it, the reception like i think what is culture Cu- culturally right the brides, the brides parents, parents typically pay, pay for yeah. the reception i think my parents actually kicked in some for that i don't remember my wife probably does but I think, so oh, if they're going to pay for it i guess they have they get probably some more say <laughs> well sure they get a little more in terms of who to invite but i mean it is I'll, I'll say this i remember our wedding so fondly it's one of the the favorite parties that that i've ever been to despite mm-hmm. my complaints about yeah. you know some of the things i wasn't able they to change eat. Because <laughs> you know everybody, right? I mean, if you go to a party and yeah. you know a few people, that's fine. But at that party, you know yeah, everybody. And true. so it's awesome. Yeah, that is true. Um, and so that was really neat. I, I, I will say this. You mentioned a couple of regrets. I have a couple of regret, regrets. I didn't get to spend enough time with a couple of the people that had traveled long distances. Mm-hmm. In particular, there was a friend, um, Miles Alfonso. 
a friend from UPS that traveled from Texas wow. and came up to come to our wedding, which was great. And I just only got to spend a few minutes with them because there were so many other mm-hmm. draws on my time. So yeah. I, uh, there are things like that to be cognizant of as you go through this. Um, but back to what another thing you were saying about uh, uh, setting boundaries. Say there's a lot of political things going on and who wants to invite who or do the kids get to come or not come? That's a big distinction, right? <laughs> that's uh, that's an area that you just have to decide how you're going to handle that within your family. Yeah, um, I have one. There's one person I will not mention their name that I that I wish I've had this conversation with Andrew recently. I would have invited and I didn't think about. I it wasn't uh-huh. an, a, a purposeful omission, sure. but it just it happened. And then that person actually mentioned something years later, and I just I, I was like, holy cow! I didn't think about that and. I really regret that. Yeah. I also regret the stupid zoot suit that I rented. Um, a what? A zoot suit. Like Brian Setzer Orchestra, Pinstripes. It was not good. Oh. oh. Yeah. Pictures. We need pictures. Yeah, we and need it was also zoot suit. No. The, my favorite picture is actually trying on suits. Not suits. Tuxedos. In, a, in one that I didn't end up getting. And my wife's like, why didn't you get that one? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I look good in that. But I ended up <laughs> getting some fubu zoot suit thing it was terrible wow so i think you know the other thing <laughs> about weddings is, and this Squirrel. is funny so this was the throughout all of america average cost of a, re- of a wedding any guess uh well i have a guess yeah what Wait, you, what's what your you guess, guess? <laughs> i'm gonna guess thirty thousand. well now that's, that's not a fair. dumb guess i'm cheating you are cheating <laughs> he stole my <laughs> notes that's not your guess <laughs> so i would have guessed let me think here i actually would have guessed probably 20 or 25 yeah i was gonna say the same thing no, and that's our our cheapskate is coming out in that <laughs> number, right? Oh, you live in Wisconsin now. Yeah, yeah. You know, true. I was and thinking I planned like client events. That's actually a lot. I would say I know, more like I was fifteen like 10, to thousand is what I was thinking. And I saw that number and I'm like, oh my goodness. You Ours know? was and six. Ours yeah, was six. Right, and that's inflation adjusted. No, that well, that was the original cost was about five or six thousand. Yeah, and yours is around ten, and mm-hmm. that was in the Chicago area. So I think you know, <laughs> I if we're my... looking at like money saving tips, location, and and obviously that's kind of yeah, you know, you're kind of constrained depending on where you live and you don't want to travel and make people travel i think that's one thing another cool thing and i have sisters that are musically inclined is and this is another thing musically inclined and i am not asking friends and family to have their skills as presence and that's that's something that's like a little okay time out yes maybe no just so you know yes i have sung at many weddings Mm -hmm. and a couple funerals and uh it is very nice because a musician has to put in a lot of practice and prep work, especially if you're having to, to, to work with an accompanist. If you have a friend, pay them for crying out loud. Don't shake your head. Uh-uh. All right. Hey, I'm no, just saying. I don't care if it's your sister. hundred bucks minimum. Thank Man. you very much. Here's a little honor. You just shot down my tip. Patrick, you had something? What's your no? I'm, it's not a bad tip, right? No, well, if you had to pay a band, it would be more than that. Yeah. It's interesting because uh, as I was thinking about that, ask your friends for things. I was also thinking about wedding gifts, right? Because you're going to get a lot of wedding gifts and stick s- to the registry. Well, that's one. <laughs> but the other thing, just a little wisdom: there are things that we asked for that Steph and I asked for that we found a few years later really just weren't useful. Okay, twelve toasters. Uh, but I mean, that's, we didn't get that, but, <laughs> right. but there are things that we didn't, but one of the things that, as you were thinking about asking your friends for skills, um, for the wedding itself, that'd be another interesting thing to ask a friend for in terms of a gift. Hey, can you, you know, in work lieu with, of a gift, in okay. lieu of a gift, all help right, me out right. with painting a room or something like that. Right. Oh my gosh. Can... I'd rather write a check. Oh, come uh, on. Yeah. <laughs> it's a labor of love for I your friend. Painting. Like. Yeah. But whatever it is, you know, that that can be something, especially as a new couple, you're going to have a lot of expenses in that area. And that might serve you a lot better than back in our day. Everybody asked for fancy China. We didn't. Ooh. We didn't because we get knew. China. Yeah, don't Nobody get... needs China. Nobody uses China. Then you just have to buy a cabinet. It's <laughs> Yeah, it's horrible. Um, so but there are a lot of other things that uh, that you see it, that that you ask for that are on those registry lists that later on you're just not going to use. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't even remember what they are because we got rid of them all. Um. <laughs> so, uh, we just no offense to anyone who gave Patrick and Stephanie a gift. Well, not no, so not all the gifts. We got rid of all the bad gifts. Yeah. that would be from our bad friends. All our good friends that might oh, listen, we yeah, still yeah, kept yeah. all theirs. Sure, that's yeah, <laughs> noted. Absolutely, so be practical. And I think the other thing we had touched on, and, and you kind of did it, was 
you know, a family friend. Now, obviously, it was on your wife's side, but hosting the reception there, and you were really practical about doing it at lunch rather mm-hmm. than in the evening to save costs. Yep. And that's you know another tip. Just and an iPod instead of a band. Yeah, and and that's and that's one thing. Now, I'll give an example. Um, Amanda has a friend who is a DJ and he does services like that. Now we're probably still going to pay him something, but that'll be, you know, if he offers that as a present. Anyhow, going back to your Excuse points. me, Mr. DJ. Would you DJ my wedding as a present? Man. I'm telling you, he wants to be paid. Friend or no friend. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Don't be and that guy. And I think the last thing, invitations, right? Doing Doing things that you can do yourself. Yeah, that's expensive. You know, that's yeah. expensive. How do you... What did you we we do? got the fancy invitations printed, um, and then Steph and her family addressed them all and mailed them. Right. Um, now, back in that day, there was no such thing as an evite or anything yeah. like that. There, that just didn't exist. <laughs> you can't do an evite to a wedding. Well, well I don't do know. Both. Whatever. Do yeah. yeah all right, right. However right. you do that these yes, days. Yes, you can. Yeah. So potluck evite <laughs> iPod. <laughs> oh my <gosh>. Outside <laughs> in the backyard. <laughs> yep. Cheap wedding. Do it. Yeah. Oh, wait. Courthouse. Nothing wrong with that. No Who people. knows? That could be a fun wedding. Yeah. You know true. what I mean? So what did you guys That's do? That's true. For, mm-hmm. What did you guys do for invitations? Oh, yeah. We had them all. Had them all done. I had little involvement, and well, I apologize for that. Apparently, but, I, I mean, should have. I mean, that's one thing. Well, where my yeah, wife's yeah, going to be like, yeah, no kidding. That's <laughs> what you're either apologizing or you're going to be thank. No, I think I'm Steph apologizing <laughs> to my wife for not doing <laughs> See, I'm I th- sure. I think Steph would thank me for the areas that I wasn't involved in. Because I asked her afterwards, like, hey, because I'd, I'd call her, but hey, what about this? She's like, oh, it's handled. And uh, what, what, what about if we did it this way? Nope. Nope. Oh, your I remember uh, going is, to the florist. Your input is not welcomed. I remember <laughs> going to the florist. Um. And I remember getting sick in the back seat because my mother-in-law, you know, my wife and my mother-in-law, they both are pretty aggressive drivers, you know, in the Chicago market. That's oh, all I remember. That's funny. Huh. And then I remember that the florist didn't bring everything. Oh. Uh, like, you know, boutonnieres or something. So oh. I don't even know if those made it. And our photographer had a busted wide-angle lens. So she took a bunch of pictures that were all blurry mm. and i remember going to look at him after she's like oh my gosh i like puked when i saw all of the pictures and uh, all the ones i used with this lens were busted like those are my memories that's oh boy yeah, yeah. we're like yeah i don't care there's people See, in the picture that aren't in the picture anymore if you know what i mean oh, yeah. yeah yeah but i think in terms of like things that that's you value podcast episode. but you know like spending time with people is more important than having you know Amazing invitations. You well, know that I mean? was one of yeah. your tips. Limit your guest list, and that's what I was thinking. Like, if you have fewer people, it's easier for you to talk to them. Right. Yeah. I don't know. Do you, Do you remember you... how many you had? Yeah, we had a little bit over 200. Oh, wow. That are, I mean, we invited about 300. Oh. Mike? I don't know. I'm going to try to find my spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> it might be a while. All right, well, I think that's good. We're going to take a break, and we're going to come back to a topic. Wait, no, no, no. Tuxes. I have a thing on this now. Something that you can do now that you couldn't do back when we got married. Oh. Oh, all right. Let's hear it. Help a tip from Mike. Buy a suit. Okay. A suit? We could have actually done that. No, 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 no. Okay, yes. That's true. You could have bought a suit. All right. So that part, that is true. What kind of what suit? What I'm referring to is this, okay? There are some websites now where you can go and they'll, you can like, ta- they walk you through taking a bunch of measurements so you can be like, hey, pay for like a custom suit. Do like you know one. any of these websites? Yes. Should I name them? Yeah, go ahead. So, like, I've re- done a lot of research on blacklapel.com, mm. uh, Indochino. There's others. I can't remember them off the top of my head. But, you know, typically renting a suit for a person is, like, two... 200 bucks. I just did one for my sister this past Yeah, summer. and they're ill-fitting. You don't get to keep them. So, like, would you rather spend 200 bucks on, some, on a crappy piece of clothing you got to give back or 400 bucks on a custom suit you can keep? Or right. you can get separates, too. I've seen people do that. Hey, wear a pair of khakis and a white shirt on a beach. No shoes. Yeah, I think that's, that's what I would do. That's a hot tip <laughs> for Mike that I think, you know. We've talked about yeah, that. Yeah, we've talked about it, and it's and Black Lapel is a great company. And If you subscribe to their email newsletter, they'll send you a lot of stuff, but it's a lot of good <laughs> stuff. So if you're interested in that, check out their website. All right. Sorry. I just had to add that. No, that's good. We needed that. So uh, we're going to take a break, and then we're going to come back and talk about um, something that I know both of you guys are pretty passionate about, and that's kind of um, you know, how to handle your finances and money at the beginning of your marriage and, and setting expectations and, and what that looks like. So stick with us. We'll be back in a minute. back 
This is Inglorious Finance. We're going to be talking now a little bit about, you know, entering marriage and what is your, how do you handle your money and where does it go and and uh, making sure you're on the same page. Um, you know, Mike, I know you've done some of this for people before, but, you know, why is this important, I guess? You know, what's wrong with just, you know, if you're coming into a marriage, just, you know, keep it how it was. Why do you need to change? This is awesome. So anybody who knows me or is listening to our podcast probably knows that I'm a huge budget nerd and so much about this and integrating finances when you get married is about just budgeting. And, and um, it's funny. I'll, I'll say it this way. I'll step back and um, just mention, I think my wife, when we were first married, was folding uh, like shirts or something, a t-shirt, and she folded it the way she was used to folding <laughs> shirts. And and I was like... You're like, what's folding? No, I, no, I actually, <laughs> I do laundry, and I did my laundry in my teens. Like, I did my own laundry okay, with my, right, my parents. All right. yep. So, um, anyway, um, she just did it differently. Here's my point, right? And I was like, wait a minute, but this is how you fold a shirt. And I was stupidly ignorant of the fact that there was more than one way to do things. And that's true for finances, too, right? So, um, you know, we grow up with these, uh, you know, tendencies, mm -hmm. right? Whether Habits. It's folding right. a shirt or, you know, oh, I, pay, I, I pay cash. Oh, really? I put everything on a credit card and I pay it off. Uh, or I don't pay it off. You know what I mean? Um, and so, you know, I got a piece of advice from a family member that I, I think was well-intentioned but was that missed the point. It was like, if I could give you one piece of advice, he told me as they were walking out the parking lot to leave, uh, it would be to have separate checking accounts. And even then I was like, really? Um, I, I did premarital counseling at, uh, just the financial aspect of pre, there's a financial class in a, in a multi-day uh, premarital counseling class at my last church. And I would come in and teach that one to groups of people who are about to get married. And um, there are certain red flags that I that I perceive when people talk to me about how they um, intend to, or even if I talk to married couples and how they relate to money. Like the language people use if they say things like, my money, her money. Yeah. Yep. Um, their money. Um, my account, their account. My debt, their debt. Yeah. Now that's that's understandable when you're first getting together because you haven't merged and considered it ours yet. I understand that, right? So that takes work. But the point is, is if that persists into a marriage, I mean, we just our last episode was on divorce. That's the number one money issues is still the number one cause of divorce. Um. So if you don't think that's problematic, you you're just ignorant. Like. You have to figure out how to work together, right? And so having a conversation about the, the very practical aspects of, you know, do you get direct deposit or a paper check? And most people get that. Do you, you know, are you going to do things with cash? How much are you going to spend? What are the actual bills? Um, to me, that, that is all very practical stuff, right? And we would have those conversations of premarital counseling if you've ever attended Financial Peace University with me, which I taught many times, we talk about that there. Um, that's a very good class, by the way. If you're going to get married, I would recommend going through FPU together. It gives you an opportunity to learn from a third party mm -hmm. uh, without trying to teach your mate about how to handle money, right? It's coming from someone else. So you both go, yeah, what do you think of that? Um, and then you'll start going, Dave said this, right? So that's better then saying, you know, you do this and I did this and whatever. Like that's, that tends to be divisive. Anyway, my point is, is I, I think it's huge to have that conversation and to get into the practical aspects of that at the beginning. Yeah. And you know what? I think it's, it's important to, you know, even I feel this is to make sure that it's coming from a third party. Um, you know, i obviously I work at, you know, as a financial advisor, so I'm going to have my own thoughts and stuff and, and sharing that with Amanda, who's, you know, soon to be my spouse hopefully you know and that's one thing but i also want her if to get she it says yes right exactly yeah. you know i want her to get it from somewhere else and and that dave ramsey and fbu is a really good source for that um so that you're on the same page and you work you know together on that so now i know mike had mentioned um you know one checking account but i know patrick you kind of have a, a system and a strategy 
not necessarily to move away from one checking account, but just to kind of structure it in terms of where the money yeah. goes and what the purpose is. So this is something that I've seen work well with certain couples. It's not something that Steph and I do. Steph and I just have one checking account. We use it and it works great for us. Um, but there was a few occasions along the way where you know, things happened in the wet, in the marriage and it was like, oh, I bought a bicycle that I didn't tell you about or <laughs> I, you know, whatever. I spent money that she wasn't expecting me to spend or it happened vice versa mm-hmm. as well. And one of the ways that I see people successfully alleviate that is I guess it's a physical form of budgeting for fun money for each. And that is to, instead of setting up just one checking account, set up three. Right. And and the it'd be one to do all the household expenses, all, you know, gas, groceries, household, whatever, everything, um, and then one for each, mm-hmm. and that one for each of the two spouses is basically play money in discretionary spending. Yeah, discretion. You can put into it, and I'll just say a couple hundred bucks a month in each, or whatever. You make whatever your, your budget, allows. whatever your budget allows that you've decided upon. So much money goes into each, and then you can each do whatever the heck you want with it. And and in that case. Then if I were to go and buy that bicycle, I would have had to have saved save that up. But for it a couple was months, yeah. yeah for, but it was within my own pot. If yeah, you will, I don't then. have a problem with that. Yeah. Actually, I think that's a that's a cool way to handle it because you know, as we as doing budget work with people is a general thing that we talk about with our clients. Um, the biggest issue is in discretionary spending. I mean, you're not going to overspend your cell phone bill <laughs> or your cable bill or your mortgage. It is what it is. Every month, it's the same amount. You don't have to try very hard to stay within your budget on your mortgage. Um, it's going out to eat. It's getting coffee in the morning. That's my big leaky bucket. You know what I mean? It's right. those things. Or if you're a shopper, I ran. <laughs> I, I knew one, one client who had a big QVC problem. Mm. Sure. So anyway... So knowing that, um, I, I think I, I, we should probably put in our show notes here a copy to our cash flow page. Um, is that macofinancial.com slash cash flow? It is. Yep. So that has a couple, uh, it has some budget worksheets on there that I think are very useful. A couple of them. Also has on there links to every dollar which is a budgeting app and a couple other yeah. items on there. A couple other ones, yeah. yeah Line app, can, a lot of people. So you need a budget. I don't use it, but I... A lot of people who like Dave Ramsey like it. it. It's software that really mimics a lot of the uh, sort of, I don't know, spirit. The sp- yeah, the spirit. In fact, when I first saw it, I thought I thought, I thought, thought the Lampo Group, which runs or Dave Ramsey Solutions, I was like, is this their software? Nope. It just, it's like. It has if, a lot of if similar If you want to do that with software instead of the paper forms, you might want to look at YNAB. I don't use it. I've used Quicken forever. Um I'm kind of actively looking for a replacement for it, but you could go back to what I used when I got married. Uh, slide rule, uh, al- almost. It was yeah, it was a green accounting ledger, <laughs> a booklet, and I just had it broken up. And I, I had use Excel, and the icon color is green. Is yeah, you could same? do that. You could change the colors to the green. Same. I use them both. But yeah, it was paper. But there's links to all those resources and video um, podcasts we did on cash flow. So. Some some good things to point people. Yep, absolutely. And if you want to take Financial Peace University, depending on where you're listening, they are on uh, they are they're pu- being put on in most markets all the time. Yeah. Uh, Google it, like Google Financial Peace University. Go to uh, Dave's site and uh, find one. Look for one in your in your area, and I re- would recommend it. It's a hundred bucks per couple for a lifetime membership which means you can spend a hundred bucks buy the kit take the class and then if you want to do it every year for the next 10 years straight you don't have to spend more money to do it um but i'm a, I'm a big advocate for that you should put a link for that on that cash flow site yeah for fpu classes we'll do that yeah that'll be ready so uh, as i think about it one of the other things that uh, i think is really important i'm just going to say it is just being straight up transparent Right. Because maybe things aren't all roses with uh, everything in your own financial life as you head into your new marriage. And it's really important to have those conversations and not hide whatever troubles are are that you may have had in the past so you can work on it together as a team. Right. We see a little bit of that where people have problems from things they did in the past and they need to work through it. Um, and, and I'm just I want to encourage our listeners to be super open and clear. This is the you're choosing the person for the rest of your life. 
and you just need to be willing to open that up and be I feel vulnerable. Like the biggest thing would be like, hey, I got five thousand dollars in credit card debt. Yeah. Or twenty five thousand dollars in student loans, right? At that age in your life, I suspect it would be. I hope so. I mean, it, assu- we're assuming most of our listeners are probably having this conversation when they're younger. Um, I will say this: I I've done premarital counseling, specifically one class of people who are getting married for the second time, uh, which is people later in life, and that's from a financial perspective, it's tougher in the sense that. You know, when you're 20 or 21, you don't really have a whole lot of experience setting up your systems. But I'm 36 and I have my systems. And if I ever, you know, if I were to, something were to happen to my wife and I got remarried at the age of 40, it would be my system. (laughs) You know, I do it now. I've been doing it for my whole adult life. You know what I mean? Sure, it'd be difficult. So what you're saying in these, these conversations are even more critical. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. Well, hey, thanks, guys, for uh, joining me and imparting some wisdom on my own part, but also hopefully for our viewers or listeners, rather, who can't see us. But uh, thanks for thanks for joining me and, and sharing your experiences. I think this will be good. And I, I hope that anybody, you know, in the broad spectrum of 20 to 40, 40, first marriage, second marriage, doesn't matter. You know, there's a lot of useful tips here. So thanks, guys. Thanks, Andrew, and uh, good luck on that proposal. If you want to learn more about us, we're available online at macofinancialgroup.com or ingloriousfinance.com. Ingloriousfinance.com. We'll bring you to, the, to, the, to our yeah. podcast page, too. Where you can and, listen to more podcasts. And shame on you, macofinancial.com, not macofinancialgroup.com. Oh, you know what, though? We've got both domains. Oh, we do? Oh, okay. I stand corrected. But please don't start going there because I'd really like to cancel that one. Someday. Right. Yeah. Or just Google us. <laughs> <laughs> and also, uh, the resource was uh, www.macofinancial.com slash cash flow. Um, that's where a lot of that um, stuff is located if you're looking for the online source. Um, you can always give us a call at 920-617-6830. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Inglorious Finance. Thanks for listening.